Today we're continuing our thoughts of how are you responding to God's Word. Last week we saw unfavorable responses to God's Word. And we saw that sometimes, unfortunately, we are offended by God's Word. Especially when it points out sins that we have rationalized away in our lives, such as gossip. Uh, perhaps a, a hot temper, and we say, well, that's just the way I am. I was just born that way. Uh, I can't help it. I got that from my dad. And when the Scripture points out to us that it is a sin, we can get offended. Uh, or sometimes uh, we get uh, uh, greatly disturbed and upset uh, by what the Scripture tells us. Uh, also, sometimes we just outright reject God's Word, and it goes against something we've held before as being right and true. Uh, and so we don't like it. We reject it. And then sometimes, unfortunately, we attack the preacher. We attack the messenger when we don't like what is said. Today, though, we're going to look at favorable responses to God's Word. And I do indeed hope you find yourself in these responses. The first one is found over in Luke chapter 1. And it has to do with Mary, the mother of Jesus. And this surrender is to surrender to the authority of God's Word. To surrender to the authority of God's Word. You will remember that Mary was visited by an angel called Gabriel. Mary was probably a teenager, and she was engaged to Joseph at this time. And the angel came to her and said that God had chosen her to be the mother of the Lord Jesus. Now Mary had taken biology 101, so she knew that there was a problem here. And so she says to the angel, well, I don't quite understand how that can be because I'm a virgin. How is it that I'm going to have a child? And the angel said to her, it's going to be a miracle. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, and you will conceive miraculously. Now, I want you to put yourself in Mary's position for a moment, particularly you ladies. Think back when you were a teenager, and even 50 years ago, and I know most of you wouldn't qualify to be a teenager 50 years ago, but you remember the stigma that was attached to an unwed mother. Uh, it was even a greater stigma in Mary's day. Uh, now imagine how she must have felt as she realized the consequences of becoming pregnant outside of wedlock. I mean, she could be stoned for adultery. What would she tell Joseph? Imagine, guys, your fiancé comes up to you and and uh, she's a virgin, and she says to you, she is pregnant. And she says, um, it's from God. How would you have reacted? All right? Well, Joseph was just like you and me, a man of flesh and blood. Uh, so she had to think, well, how is Joseph going to take this? What about going to your parents and saying, Mom and Dad, I'm pregnant, but I'm still a virgin. Uh-huh, yeah. Well, it's the Holy Spirit brought it. Imagine mom and dad's reaction. Imagine their hurt. Imagine the embarrassment that she anticipates that they are going to experience. And so put yourself in Mary's position when God comes to her through his angel and announces his word to her is that he has chosen her to give birth miraculously to his son. She knows and anticipates the embarrassment, the stigma that's going to be attached to her. And by the way, that stigma lasted for years. In fact, when Jesus was a, an adult, he was accused of being born out of fornication. So obviously the rumor continued even unto Jesus' adulthood. 
Yet how was Mary going to respond to this word even though it was going to cost her dearly in suffering, pain, embarrassment? We pick up her response in verse 38. But verse 37, the angel says, For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold, the bond slave of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. Mary's response was one of surrender to the authority of God's word. She refers to herself as the bond slave of the Lord. Now there were different levels of being a servant in biblical days. The bottom of the rung of the ladder, the lowest of all servants, was the bond slave, the bond servant. These were the guys that were used to, to, roar, to, to row the boats with the oars, uh, the ones that would have to, they'd have all about 50 oars and 25 on each side, and those were the guys that had to do the roaring of the oars. It was the lowest of the low slave. And this is what Mary says she had, Lord, I, I submit to your authority totally and absolutely in my life. The bondservant in biblical days had no rights. His master could take his life at will, and no one could say anything. He had no will but his master's will. And so what Mary is saying when she calls herself a bond slave of the Lord is she is saying, Lord, I surrender to your will for my life completely, absolutely. Even though this is going to cause me embarrassment, even though I can't imagine what I'm going to go through because of this, nevertheless, she says, be it done unto me according to your word. Absolute surrender. Lord, this is what you want for me. If this is your will for my life, I surrender to it. I'm just your bond slave. I'm here to do your will, whatever it is. Now that is the kind of response we want to give to God's Word. God comes to you and He says, I'm calling you to missions. And I want you to go way off to the boondocks of the Amazon Basin. How are you going to respond? You know it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you physically. It's going to cost you mentally. It's going to cost you financially. But are you willing to surrender? Do you say, Lord, I'm your bond slave. Whatever you want. Whatever you call me to do. Now you may be here today. Maybe God has spoken to you and told you He wants you to do something. Have you surrendered to that? even though it's going to cost you, even though you may indeed endure some persecution because of it, you will have to sacrifice. Have you surrendered to it? Second favorable response to God's Word is found over in Luke chapter 5. Here we see Peter. Peter had been out fishing all night, and he had caught nothing. He comes in, and they're putting the nets out to let them dry so they can go out the next day. And Jesus is teaching, and a large multitude has followed him. And so Jesus says to Peter, let's get out a little bit in the boat so that I can speak to the multitudes, and they will hear what I say. And then after he's finished teaching, he says to Peter, Peter, let's go out for a catch. And here we have Peter confronted with the word of the Lord when it doesn't make good sense to him. But he responds, nevertheless, in obedience to God's word. First of all, Peter had caught nothing the whole night before. Night was when they went fishing. And here Jesus is saying, let's go back out. It didn't make fishing sense. It didn't make sense according to the way Peter's occupation taught. If the nets had not dried, he wouldn't be able to go out that next night. So not only would he lose one night, but if he didn't catch anything when Jesus went out during the day, he would lose the next night's wages. It would be a financial sacrifice for him. 
And so he comes to Jesus when Jesus says this, and we're picking up in Luke chapter 5, beginning with verse 4. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered and said, Master, we've worked hard all night and caught nothing. In other words, Jesus, let's think about this. I mean, this is really not a good idea. You don't realize we've already been out all night and we didn't catch anything. And now you're saying, go back out? We just came in. But look what Peter says. Peter says, but I will do as you say and let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great quantity of fish and their nets began to break. He obeyed the Lord, even though it didn't make sense to him to do so. He obeyed the Word. Now I want you to notice three things about this obedience. First of all, it was literal obedience. Literal obedience. He did exactly as Jesus told him. He didn't try to change what Jesus said to make it better fit what he wanted to do. Sometimes we're guilty of that, aren't we? You remember King Saul in the Old Testament? He did that. God came to him through Samuel and said, I want you to go and I want you to to destroy the Amalekites. They have attacked my people. I want you to destroy them and to destroy them completely. Everything. All the people, all the cattle, all the sheep, everything. I want it all destroyed. So Saul went out, and he changed it a little bit. He decided he would keep some of the best people. He would keep some of the best sheep and some of the best oxen. And so he's coming back, and he meets Samuel the prophet, and Samuel says, how's it going? And Saul said, hey, it's going great, man. I've obeyed the Lord. And about that time, the oxen begin to low, and the sheep, Begin bleeding. Samuel says, if you've obeyed the Lord, then what's that I hear? And so Saul starts backtracking. Uh, 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 well, I just kept the best to sacrifice to God. Now surely that should be all right, right? I just kept it to sacrifice it. And to that Samuel says, those famous words, it's better to obey than to sacrifice. This tells me partial obedience is disobedience. We want to obey God partially and call it obedience. And he says to me, if you don't obey me absolutely, you've not obeyed obeyed me at all, even when it might not make sense. You think it made sense for Noah to build an ark in the middle of a desert when it had never rained, much less flooded? (laughs) No. But he obeyed God. And his wife was happy he did. (laughs) Look at Abraham. You think it made sense to Abraham when God said, leave your family, leave the country that you know, and go to a place you've never been before? No, that didn't make sense. Back in those days, you stayed together. Families grew generation after generation, just hung out, extended family. That's where you were safe. That's where you knew people. That's where you knew the situation. And just to pick up and go to somewhere you've never gone before? No. But Abraham obeyed God literally. He obeyed Him completely. Not only was the obedience of Peter literal obedience, but it was an active obedience. Peter didn't argue, he just obeyed. He didn't even try to figure out the consequences of what was going to happen if he obeyed. He didn't even get a group of fishermen together and said, guys, let's vote on this. He obviously wasn't Baptist. Right? He just obeyed God. Didn't need a committee vote. The Word was to do it, and so he did it. Not only was it a literal and active obedience, but it was a universal obedience. We do everything Jesus says, not just what we want to do. Some people talk about the non-essentials of Scripture. The problem with that is each person decides what's non-essential 
And it always happens to be what they don't want to do. Are you obeying the Word of God? God has told some of you to give and to give more than you're giving now. Have you obeyed Him? Or are you trying to argue with Him? But, but, but Lord, I can't make it if I do that. I mean, I'm not hardly paying my bills. I'm not paying all my bills now. And you want me to give? Trying to figure out the consequences or simply being obedient. I know some people that God tells them to give and they'll give one paycheck, but then when the next paycheck, paycheck comes, they decide, well, I can't do it this week. Now, that's not obedience. That's partial obedience. Now, God may have spoken to you about some area. Now, I just want you to, first of all, make sure it's God speaking. You got three voices speaking to you. You got your voice, you've got God's voice, and you've got the devil's voice. And the problem is they all sound the same. They sound like you. So you got to determine which voice is this. And if God's telling you to do something and it may not make sense to you, then I would encourage you to go to someone who is in spiritual authority over you and share with them what you think God's telling you to do. Because people have done some weird things in what they say is the name of the Lord. God told me to do it. So if it's something way out there, you know, I wouldn't have faulted Noah if he'd gone to someone in spiritual authority over him and said, look, I think God's telling me to build an ark here. Once it's determined, yes, this sounds like God, it may not make sense. It may, I can't understand the consequences, but God has said to obey. It doesn't violate any other teaching of Scripture. It is of the new covenant. It applies to me. Therefore, by His grace, I will obey. So first favorable response is surrender to the authority of Scripture in your life. If God says it, then that sells it. We're going to do it. Secondly, obedience. Literal, active, and universal obedience. The third favorable response to God's Word is repentance and faith. Repentance and faith. We see this over in Acts. When Peter was preaching at Pentecost, and he was preaching to the Jewish men who had gathered there, and he was preaching to them that God had indeed lifted up Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah, this very one that they had crucified. Look at what it says in verse 37 of chapter 2 of Acts. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. And they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent, each of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When Peter preached that they had crucified the one that God had chosen to be the Lord Christ, the Scripture says they were pierced to the heart. Now this word pierced to the heart means to be Stung sharply. It means to smite. It means to be smitten in conscience. It's associated with remorse and sorrow. In other words, they were broken. They were humbled by God's Word. And they realized they had done wrong. It convicted them. It pierced their heart, their conscience. Notice how different that is from the response we saw last week to the Pharisees, to Stephen's preaching. You remember? It says that they were cut to the quick. And that word is associated with anger, getting angry and upset because you have been, been ex your sin has been exposed and, and, and you don't humble yourself, but you bow up in pride and you resist. And they ended up killing Stephen. But here we have a different reaction. 
Not one of anger and bowing up, but one of sorrow and one of remorse and one of saying, oh no, we've done wrong. Indeed, we have crucified the Christ. When these men heard God's truth about Jesus, that God had made Him both Lord and Christ, that they had crucified Him, they were smitten in their conscience. They were stung sharply. They realized they were wrong, and they were open to change. That's the key thing. Repentance. When confronted with the truth of God's Word, do you repent? Do you become remorseful and realize, yes, man, that's wrong. I have done wrong. They said, what must we do to be saved? They repented. They had a change of mind that led to a change of life. This Jesus that they had seen as a criminal, they now saw Him as the Christ. The one that they had crucified, they were now to crown Him as Lord in their lives. That's the change that comes with repentance. Repentance is not just a sorrow, not just a remorse, but it always results in a change of the way you see and a change in the way you act. They no longer saw Christ as just a man, but they saw Him as the Lord, as the Messiah, as God's anointed one. And they repented. They changed their thinking and changed their acting. They were humble and broken and sorrowful. And then they believed, verse 41. So then those who had received His word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. They received the Word. They embraced the truth of God and crowned Jesus as Lord in their lives. And they were baptized. When God's Word shows you, exposes sin in your life, do you respond in repentance and faith? Over in Colossians 3.19, we saw on Father's Day, where the Scripture says, Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. And I'll share with you that word embittered means to be harsh. You have no excuse to ever act harsh, grumbly, mean-spirited to your wife. Now, when I preach that on Father's Day, how did you respond? Now, I know all of you have been that way, so don't even go there. I am one, too. So I know we've all been there. So did you say, oh, God, I've sinned. Man, I didn't know it, but that I have done that. Lord, I repent. And go to your wife and say, honey, I know I'm guilty of that. I've asked the Lord to forgive me now. Will you forgive me? Now, that's responding in repentance and faith. How about when the Scripture says, as I mentioned a few weeks ago in Philippians 2, do all things without grumbling or disputing. How did you respond to that Scripture? Did you say, "Mm, God, I'm guilty. Man, I know I grumble. I know I'm a grumble at work. I know I complain. Lord, forgive me. Give me the grace not to do that again. Or did you say, ah, that's too bad. I, I, I can't be perfect. You know, I've got to have some vice. Or how about Matthew 6.25 when Jesus says, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life, what you're going to eat or what you're going to put on. Do you have a problem with worry? Is your response, God, that's wrong. I acknowledge with you, that's a sin. I shouldn't worry, and I'm going to look to you to enable me to believe you and not worry. That's responding in repentance and faith. So the next time God shows you something in the Word, and it pierces your heart, will you respond in repentance and faith? 
And then the fourth favorable response is to examine the Scriptures. Over in Acts 17, <clears throat> on one of Paul's missionary journeys, he went to the city of Berea, and he was preaching at the synagogue, as was his habit to do. And now these people in the synagogue obviously, obviously were Jewish. And he began to preach about Jesus being the Messiah, being the Christ, being the Lord. And these people were noble-minded, the Scripture says. And you know what they did? Unlike the Sadducees we saw last week, who again got greatly upset, unlike the Pharisees who wanted to attack Stephen, they said, well, let's search the Scriptures and see about this. I mean, this is something we haven't heard before, but hey, we're open to it. Let's see if this is indeed what the Scripture teaches. As we see over in Acts 17, in verse 10, the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, and when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now there were more, they were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with great eagerness, examining the Scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore many of them believed, along with a number of prominent Greek women and men, they examine the Scriptures. Now this word examine is, is interesting. In the Greek it means to sift up and down. You have a sifted wheat. I mean you break it down into the finest particles, don't you? This means to examine closely. To look at something real thoroughly. In and out. It reminds me of these CSI, criminal scene investigators, who go into a a crime scene, and man, they begin just to look at everything. They take pictures of everything. They get every minute particle and, and trace evidence and, and look at all of it and analyze it. Now, that's examining it. And that's what these Bereans did with the Scriptures. They looked closely. They thoroughly examined the Scriptures to see if what Paul was saying was true. And upon finding out that it was true, they believed. They experience salvation. Every Christian should follow the example of the Bereans. Anytime you hear any teacher or preacher speak something that you're not familiar with, that you haven't held to and believed before, you need to check out the Scriptures. Do it with me. Check the Scriptures. I want you to. I am fallible. I make mistakes. I don't know everything, even though I might act like it sometimes. I don't. Now, examine the Scriptures. See what God's Word says. Last week, I said Jesus didn't come to save as many as people as He could, but He came to save those whom God had given to Him. Now, that may be new to you. Examine the Scriptures and see what the Scriptures teach if you don't agree. See what the Word says. But now make sure when you're examining the Scriptures, you don't let tradition determine your outcome, or not wanting to change, your resistance to change determining the outcome of your study, but honestly look at the Scriptures and see what they teach. So it's always appropriate, always acceptable, always good to examine the Word of God, to study it. God has given us the Holy Spirit. Now, there are some groups that say only the, the priest can interpret the Scriptures. But I want you to know God has given you the Holy Spirit and you can take the sound principles of the historical, grammatical rules of interpretation and you can understand the Scriptures. He will teach you the Word of God if you will study it thoroughly using sound biblical methods of exegesis and interpretation. It's not just a few who have the ability to understand the Word. And I encourage you to get into the Scriptures, to study it, to learn what God has to say. That brings us to our conclusion. How are you responding to God's Word? Now, I'm going to put up beside each other 
Last week's unfavorable responses and this week's favorable responses. Now, where do you fall in the camp? Are you offended by the Word of God? Or do you surrender to its authority in your life? Are you rejecting it when God tells you something that's going to make you change? Or are you obeying even though it may cost you personally? Do you become greatly disturbed when you see something in the Scriptures or hear something that's contrary to something you previously held to? Or do you respond in repentance and faith? Are you responding by attacking the preacher or by examining the Scriptures? The Bible is God's Word. How will you respond to it in your life? Let's pray. Father, we do praise you for your word, for the truthfulness of your word, for the power of your word. And I pray that your spirit will enable each of us to respond appropriately and in surrender, in obedience in repentance and faith that you might be honored and glorified in our lives. We look to you for that grace. In Jesus' name, amen.